today we start to talk about uh, cell structure. It's going to be not um, a lot of completely new material. Most of it you've heard before. Uh, we will chat about the historical background. We are privileged to know that living organisms consist of cells, actually. We're privileged to know that life does not appear by itself, you know. It can just generate it spontaneously, as we discussed. And it wasn't that way all the time. Francesco Redi actually was the first uh, person who demonstrated that, um, like in a piece of meat, maggots do not arise by themselves. You know, they, if there is no, uh, there are no flies that seed there, no maggots. It was the first blow. Later it was Pasteur with this famous experiment with the U-shaped neck with a flask. When a neck remained intact, I told you before, that flask can be still seen in a Pasteur museum in Paris. But when the neck was broken, contamination from the air produced uh, bacterial growth. So it was a conv quite a convincing experiment in terms of the dismantling the spontaneous generation theory. Uh, at the same, roughly at the same time, these four scientists, Schleiden, Schwann, Birkhoff, and uh, Remak, suggested that cell is the major building unit <coughs> of the of the nature. Not just suggested, they demonstrated that one cell um, comes from another. So if you think about it, it's never-ending line. Cell does not appear from nowhere. Okay, just it, it starts, it originates from other cell. Maybe through mitosis or being refission or differentiation of cells when cell evolves into another cell. Does that make sense? And there was actually quite a breakthrough. And the link between the cell being a, a major unit of life major elementary unit of life. Since we're so used to it, we may not really appreciate how big the breakthrough was. Because 17th century Hooke already <clears throat> saw cells, right, but never made that link. It's the hardest part to make the link. Um, Next, we're going to chat about germ theory of disease first, and then we're going to talk about endosymbiosis. So germ theory. We have a bunch of cells, right? We already know about microbes. It's the um, middle of 19th century. But so far, we don't have a convincing evidence that there is such thing as infectious disease. And as I told you before, Zemmelweis was the first person who linked transmission of microbes from morgue to patients in maternity ward. You can see that graph here. That was the, uh, the frequency of purpural fever in maternity ward before chlorine wash. And that was after. See? It just precipitated uh, dramatically, right? Lowered that chlorine wash, lowered it dramatically. And Zemmelweis actually proposed that it was some sort of an infectious agent. And Lister later, with his work, surgical techniques, developed that idea. He suggested that yes, it's something, something transmittable. But the link between the microbe and the disease was kind of missing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the first one that suggested the actual link was Pasteur. So he actually coined the term virus. He called all inf infectious microbes viruses. Then it was slightly changed, you know. But Pasteur suggested that disease may be caused by the infectious agent 
observable infectious agent. He demonstrated that microbes um, can be a cause of disease. And the last, say, stone in the foundation of that germ theory was placed by Robert Koch, who formulated four postulates. Well, I don't like to I don't like the number because it's not about the number. It's about the whole approach that Koch suggested to establish the link between the microbe, the, the infectious agent, and the observable disease. And I want you to understand that if we have a, a patient with a certain disease and we isolate a microbe from this patient, it doesn't mean that microbe causes the disease. Do you agree with me? Well, what I suggest is we're going to go down the road of Koch. We're going to do the same, well, presumably same logical steps that he did to formulate the postulates. First, you have a patient who is sick and you suspect that microbe, just let's call it the microbe, causes the disease. You have no proof yet. What do you have to do? Which steps do you have to take to prove it? First, take a sample from the patient. For what? What are you going to do with that sample? Good, you got the sample. Huh? For what? Say again, to see if... No, 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 no. I, we have... I'm explaining. To have a patient, what symptoms do you want him to have? Fever, okay. Patient with a fever. And you suspect that a microbe named microbe causes the fever. So take a sample. Why? What do you do with the sample? You look for microbe. Okay, so you try to find microbe in that sample. Is that the only sample you're going to take? Like overall? What else? Okay, from the same patient? Okay, that's it? Excellent. So you got to have a sample from the healthy patient, right? You gotta have a negative control. Does that make sense? So you have a sick person and a healthy person, and you get samples from them, and you look for the microbe that you suspect. Presume that you find the microbe in the person who's sick, and do not find it in the person who's healthy. Is that enough? Not really. Not really. Maybe not causative link but association how do you prove causation hmm? that's dr howe's approach let's treat it if patient survives we're good if he dies we were wrong huh? um yeah, that's robert Koch's time forget about antibodies Good idea. I like the lack of normal human ethics. Give it to somebody else and see if. Well, they didn't. Well, they did have ethics. It was what a little different. Uh, they didn't give it to someone else. Huh? Rats, or, well, they used it on themselves often. Okay. Yeah, another person. Well, not, I mean, not every, not somebody else. I would give it to somebody else. I would not take it. Uh, actually, there was a story when um, Walter Reed was testing if yellow fever is transmitted by mosquitoes. There were experiments when people subjected themselves to the bites of mosquitoes that they knew were carriers of yellow fever. And there was a story, a very sad story, when two friends did that. One died, one didn't. They both got sick, but one died. It was pretty sad. <laughs> huh? Yeah. So, so, 
They, they were medical residents, not students. So, okay, you put that microbe that you isolated in another model, in another model organism, human or animal, preferably animal. What do you do next? What kind of symptoms? A fever. Same symptoms. You, you look if that organism placed in the model causes the same disease in the model. We have one last step. We have to do one last step with the model. After the model develops the symptoms. Excellent. You take the sample from the model and, and see if you can isolate that same microbe. Does that make sense? That's your Cox postulates. So you have to isolate from sick but not healthy people. The microbe have to cause the same type of symptoms in a healthy model. And microbe must be isolated from that model. And it, it, should, be, it should match the initial one. Does that make sense? They don't work. You can't use them, the Cox postulates. Why? Really, I mean, it's really hard. No, much. I mean, what's the problem? With postulates themselves, there's one part that is awfully hard to comply with. Oh, no, I mean, take the sample. Be my guest, especially if it's intestinal. I can provide you with a bunch of... Patients can provide you with a lot of the stool samples. There's one step that is really unreliable. Right there in the middle. What do you do in the middle? In, in the middle of like this there's three steps, we have like three steps. What's the middle step? Finding a model or okay. Picking up the microbe that actually causes the disease. But it will be quickly, you, you can quickly figure it out. You give it to somebody else, no disease. Okay, that's fine. Make sense? Model. The same exact microbe that causes fever in humans may cause diarrhea in rats. Does that make sense? That's the problem. It's a big problem. There are, of course, other problems because, you know, uh, you sample, as, as, as Andrew said, you take the microbe, you can find it in sick people but not in healthy people, but maybe it's just associated with the disease. Maybe it doesn't cause it. Maybe you can find it because the person is sick and the immune system is down. Make sense? A lot of problems, especially model problems. Okay, let's go ahead with endosymbiosis. <coughs> Theory of how eukaryotic cells acquired some of the critical organelles. First eukaryotes, something like 2 billion years ago. I wasn't there. So, uh, but, so I've heard. They told me. Uh, two billion years ago, first eukaryotes. Um, we don't know how they formed. We can only speculate. We can offer hypotheses. Uh, one of the hypotheses that I personally like, you already have DNA kind of concentrated in, in the center, in the part, one part of the cell. Eventually, it becomes enclosed in the membrane. Um, Evolutionary advantage at this point was doubtful, but it just happened. Now, think about this. It's, evolution is somewhat accidental, so it happened. Next thing that uh, eukaryotes did, those ancient eukaryotes, they acquired chloroplasts and mitochondria. Now, why do we know? Why do we... Why are we pretty sure that they are acquired? So Lynn Margulis suggested that 
they actually mitochondrion chloroplasts are descendants yes DNA they have their own DNA exactly they have their own genome mitochondrial and chloroplast genome so they used to be independent cells right is there any other process any other characteristic that would suggest that they used to be independent chloroplasts do mitochondria okay so they do make energy not any other uh, organelle can do that yes they can do energy metabolism something else living things what is the main objective in life turns out they can reproduce if you take chloroplasts and inject them in the egg chicken egg they will replicate by themselves I mean they can't live outside of the cell but they can live in the cell like a chicken egg does that make sense so it we still consider it a hypothesis because we never saw the actual moment when they went into the cell but the hypothesis is pretty convincing so that's endosymbiosis. Endo means inside, yes. Symbiosis means living together. What was the advantage for host for that ancient eukaryote? Why was it good to acquire a thing like a mitochondrial chloroplast? Yeah, yeah. Energy production. Chloroplasts even give you some carbohydrates. What was good for, in that for mitochondria, chloroplasts, or protection. protection? Yes, protection, and also source of chemicals. They had constant supply of whatever they metabolized. That makes sense. It turns out that endosymbiosis happens now, not at the same fundamental level like changing the cellular structures. But there are systems, there's a system of tick protozoa that lives in tick and bacteria that lives in the protozoa. I think that, that that's how it works. Uh, well, tick can live without them, but those two lower guys, they must be in the tick. They just can't survive without tick and they can't survive without each other. Like bacteria without protozoa and protozoa without bacteria. They are endosymbionts, like it's a multi-level endosymbiosis. Make sense? So we gotta we gotta know it's not a one-time event. The cell, I'm really proud of that slide. Like I made it. Well, not the whole thing. I didn't picture the cell as you can tell. It's professionally drawn. I can't do that kind of a job. But I made those little red writings. It's a summary of functions. Um, some of you may know, well, definitely know, the way to eat elephant, piece by piece, yes, you eat elephant piece by piece, so study things like that, piece by piece, chapter by chapter, you don't try to memorize all of it, you try to make a concept. So the concept that I suggest, the, the, the separating the cell in parts, will include you know, talking about the internal parts, talking about the envelope, talking about the external parts. And another very fundamental concept that I want to introduce to you is the parts that cell can and cannot live without. Okay, so let's see <clears throat> what every cell must have. Tell me. No, not the cell wall, absolutely not. Our cells, mammalian cells, do not have cell wall. Every cell, okay, every prokaryotic cell absolutely must have. Mm -hmm. Nucleoid, you close in terms of the wall, not the wall. The membrane, something else. What fills up the cell? Cytoplasm, I mean, you take out the cytoplasm, 
right? You can't. So, cell membrane, nucleoid, cytoplasm, something else. Ribosomes. Why? They make proteins, right? And without proteins, there's no cell. And surprisingly, this is it. There are cells like, technically, mycoplasma, I think, that's all, all it has. Cytoplasm, nucleoid, uh, membrane, and ribosomes. And that's it. You don't have to. But many, many cells have additional stuff. Okay? Additional stuff includes on the inside inclusions. It's just storage. Vehicles. Storage things. On, as a component of the envelope of the cell. Cell wall. Outside of the cell wall, you may have a capsule. Generally speaking, it's called glycocalyx. Okay? Like an, an even more outer layer. And various appendages. The flagellum for movement. Not every cell moves. Uh, pilus. I'll keep you intrigued. What do we need pilus from? Well, not we, uh, bacteria. Fimbriae helps to attach cells to the um, surfaces, okay? But except for ribosomes, and uh, ribosomes, cytoplasm, membrane, and nucleoid, all this additional stuff is just be bells and whistles. Technically, cell does not need it. Um, bacterial cells of different shapes, as you had a chance to observe, when we looked at the uh, microbes that you isolated from your hands under the microscope. And you must know the major cell, major shapes that we talk about here. So spherical ones are called cocci, and you've seen cocci when you looked at the Staphylococcus epidermidis and Micrococcus lativus under the microscope. Okay. The rod-shaped bacilli, I don't remember who sampled the large white colony, whoever had it, large white colony, that was Bacillus, probably Bacillus cereus, that you've got on your hands. It's a rod-shaped cell. Slightly bent rod here, curved rod, it's called Vibrio. I haven't seen one yet, thank God. It would be a disaster, it's probably going to be pathogenic. Um, Cacobacilli is something, you know, in between the caucus and bacillus, like slightly elongated sphere. It's not sphere anymore. And spirillum and spirochete are spiral forms. Spirochete is thinner and longer. See? The uh, syphilis, causative agent of syphilis, treponema pallidum, is a spirochete, for example. Now, these individual cells <coughs> can sometimes form uh, more organized structures. Those of you who who, did, who sampled the yellow colony, okay, if you look under the microscope, you will see, you can see, that a lot of micrococcus cells are organized in a form of diplococcus tetrad. They flow together. Those of you who sampled white colony, Staphylococcus epidermidis colony, probably noticed that it forms like big, big assemblies, clusters. That, that cluster is called Staphylococcus. Okay, Streptococci, microbes for example, that uh, Streptococcus pyogenes microbe that causes the uh, throat infection, forms chains. That's why strepto. Chains of bacilli will be streptobacilli. A lot of this is reflected in the names of microbes. Now, look, we just, we kind of, you know, reveal what we can recognize using very simple methods that are available for us. Now, when you look at your sample under the microscope, you can tell the shape you can look at the arrangement, 
So you can say if it's the Philococcus or Streptococcus or something else, right? Later, when we will learn how to stain, you will be able to see whether it's gram positive or gram negative. So it becomes really fascinating to know. You know, you, you can almost identify the microbes without using any complicated equipment whatsoever. Yes? So, like bacteria that are Say again? So, uh, Which one? All bacteria are prokaryotic cells. Oh, it can exist as a signal, single cell, okay? But when you look at it, you will see the character. So, like streptococci, you're going to see single cells and chains. Staphylococci, single cells and clusters. That makes sense? Diplococci, single cells and doubled. Oh, they just stick to each other. I mean, um, like if we take each other's hands, we're not going to make a new organism. We just hold each other's hands. Right? So they kind of, sometimes for some reason, due to probably some surface proteins, they organized in that, uh, that shape. Does that make sense? Did I answer? how cells can maintain such a structure. Um, they inflated by cytoplasm. What keeps them? Essentially osmotic pressure keeps them inflated. And we have to recall what osmosis is. You tell me what osmosis is. Water diffusion from where to where? high concentration of water to low concentration of water. But we usually don't speak in terms of water concentration. Well, it has to go through semipermeable membrane, but concentration of what we usually talk about? Uh, no, I mean like sodium, sodium solutes, right? So if water diffuses from its high to low in terms of the solute concentration, how can we rename those? If water concentration is high, solute concentration is low. Does that make sense? And if solute concentration is high, then water is low. Does that make sense? If this is the beaker, separated by semi-permeable membrane, on the left, you have a lot of water with just a little bit of salt. On the right, you have just a little bit of water with a lot of salt. You see how concentration of water is different? Concentration of water is going to be higher on this half, but not on this half. So water will simply diffuse this way. You can, when I was learning that, I also you know, made kind of a little trick for myself. Tell myself, water dilutes things. If you add water, you dilute something, right? So, if you have very concentrated solution, water in this chamber wants to dilute it. So it will go and dilute it. Does that make sense? Just just a, a mind trick to remember which direction it goes. Water always wants to make concentration lower. That's why osmosis happens. So water follows sodium. Usually, water follows salt. Does that make sense? Now, there are three types of the environment. Isotonic environment, when solute concentration is equal outside of the cell and inside of the cell. Hypertonic, when solute concentration outside is hypertonic. Greater, yes, higher than inside. In hypotonic environment, when solute concentration outside is lower. Does that make sense? When I always say solute concentration, what kinds of solutes can we find in water, like in Lake Erie? 
Hmm? What kinds of solutes can we find in Lake Erie? Yeah. What can be dissolved in that water? Okay, organics, a lot of organic molecules. Hmm? Yeah, minerals, sodium, potassium, magnesium. Now you see, we suddenly have to refer to many different chemicals. So how can we measure that, that vague concentration of solids? For this we have a term osmolality, which refers to number of chemical particles, number of atoms or ions or molecules. Make sense? We have two salts. When salt dissolves in water, it breaks down into ions. Which of these salts, sodium chloride or sodium sulfate, will give you more ions, number-wise? Sodium sulfate. Why? How many it will give you when it dissociates? Mm -mm. Three. It will give you two sodium and one sulfate. Okay, better example. Sodium chloride and magnesium chloride. You see? Sodium chloride, two ions. Magnesium chloride, three. Does that make sense? So if you make solutions, with the same concentration, same number of molecules, sodium chloride and magnesium chloride. Magnesium chloride will give you higher solute concentration, higher number of particles, will give you higher osmolality. Does that make sense? Good. Because that's what we're going to chat about when we chat about response of the cell to the different environments. When environment is isotonic, what's going to happen to the cell? Hmm? Nothing, yeah. The flow of water, net flow, will be zero. Is that clear? When environment is hypertonic, when there's a lot of salt outside of the cell, where would water go? Outside, what's going to happen to the cell? shrink, cytoplasm is going to reduce. Do you think cells like it? I don't think so. I don't think so. Losing water is the bad idea. What about hypotonic environment? What will go in? What's going to happen to the cell? If it doesn't have anything that prevents swell, because it, many bacterial cells have the cell wall. Okay? Okay? So they will become turgid, swollen, okay, kind of puffy, like a, a, a balloon. A lot of bacterial cells, especially in the environment, they exist in hypotonic conditions. Think about microbes that live in lakes or rivers or any other fresh water sources, okay? So cell wall prevents them from lysis. That makes sense? So we figured out that hypertonic environment is bad. And it actually is used um, in the way pickles stay eatable for such a long time. Like you can checking you can get pickle, hold it in your hands and put it back. Yeah, it's salt. Salt that prevents growth of microbes, right? And people do it all the time. I mean, we were doing that for thousands of years. Um, another, strawberries. How would you, the easiest way to preserve uh, berries? No, it's fine. I didn't think about it. Yeah, freeze them. You don't have a freezer. You lived thousand years ago. Well, what do you mix it with? Sugar. And what sugar creates? Hypertonic environment, right? It's highly hypertonic. You don't really care what solute it is. It can be sugar, it can be salt, doesn't matter. Does that make sense? 
Um, well, Dead Sea is filled with bacteria. You can't even drown in the Dead Sea. It's so salty. The um, farm, well, farms like little the things, you know, manufacturing things that make sea salt in a San Francisco Bay. They have gigantic pools where ocean water evaporates, living like, like a brine, okay? And different pools have different concentration of brine. And it gets progressively higher in terms of the salt. And those pools are colored in different way because of the bacteria and archaea that live in them. They give it color. How the heck do they live in such a salty environment? What do they do? How they survive? Remember, look, I didn't tell how they survive in hypertonic environment. I said how they survive in such salty environment. In order to survive, yes, they have high salt concentration in the cytoplasm. Does that make sense? What we consider salty for them, normal. Got it? Terrific. Um, I'm going to stop at this.